forward. Okay. All right. So my first question is to you is, why is it so important that you have um, Soul Premiere on video demand this month? Well, okay, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna answer that in one second. I just realized I have to fix this, mm -hmm. so you can see my name right. There it is. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so we are so excited to be able to premiere Mr. Soul in the virtual cinema space. First of all, it's like a, the new model for distribution for independent films, and I think it it creates a certain amount of meritocracy, which doesn't often happen when you have an independent film. Um, we're still looking for a distributor, but we still wanted the film to come out right now. I think it's a really exciting film about, uh, it's a tribute to, it's a, it's a tribute, if not a love letter to black culture mm -hmm. and black love, black intellect, black history, black music. Um, and that I felt like now is the time that we really need this story, that we need the story of a leader, like uh, a change agent, like Ellis Hazlett, who was the host and producer of the Soul Show from 1968 to 1973. And we are at an inflection point, it feels like right now in this nation, not only because of the pandemic, clearly, but we are on the eve of a great racial reckoning. And I really believe that this is a, a time that we can leap forward. So I'm really grateful to be able to bring Mr. Soul uh, to the virtual space so people can watch at home. You know, there's a lot of people at home right now and it's hard to stay inspired, number one, and to find new content that you haven't seen. And our film is both of those things. It's inspiring, it's not only is it inspirational, but it's informational and it's historical and it's entertaining. And to have all of those attributes in one film that happens to be a documentary is kind of rare. So I'm excited that it's refreshing to know that there is original black content out there and with a chance to be seen by just about anybody who can log on or uh, find a way to come to one of our platforms or even support their local cinema platforms. So what we're doing is we're opening in over 50 independent virtual cinema spaces around the country. So you can support your favorite local um, cinema as well as supporting wow. the film. That's, a, that's amazing. It's awesome. Yeah, so it's a way of giving back as well. You know, this is not we're not out here clout chasing. You know, this yeah. is a difficult time and uh, it's been a very tragic time for many. And so we're hoping to show and share this film as a gift that is both inspirational and hopeful and gives black people a chance to be proud and people of color a chance to be proud and to say, well, look how far we've come. Yes, look how far we have yet to go, mm -hmm. but really look how far we've come and um, to know that Black excellence has always been there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so one of the things I didn't know this I did like was the Blair Underwood reading of the quotes. Yes. For one, how did you choose him? And then how were you able to pick the certain quotes? That's a great question. And um, for those who haven't seen the film, I don't want to give a spoiler, but I will explain that one of the important aspects of this film is the character of Ellis Hayslip. So he is the producer and sort of reluctant host of Soul, sort of starts out as a fish out of water kind of host and then grows with the film to being the perfect host in the end by the time the show's canceled. And this is a show that's on PBS. And so we wanted to also get into the interiority of this character and the tricky part is that he's deceased. He passed away from cancer in 1991. But more importantly, we only have footage of him from when he was on the show, which is somewhat of a performative footage. We didn't have a, a lot of footage of him as a person. And we wanted to give him agency in the story. We wanted to put him front and center. So I created these little vignettes that are chances to drop in onto, into the thought process of Ellis Hayslip. What was he thinking and what was the impetus behind the show? 
And so in order to do that, I had carefully researched everything that he'd ever written. Um, I had access to the Ellis Hazlett collection at the Smithsonian, which is a collection of his own papers and writings and all the ephemera that he collected from his lengthy career in the arts. So that's at the Anacostia Smithsonian, which is part of the larger Smithsonian institution. I'm hoping they'll move it down to the, to the, the new Blacksonian on the mall, but we'll have to see. Um, and so there, there's a plethora of his writings there, but also every single article, whether it's in the black newspapers or the New York Times, Essence, Jet, um, you know, uh, Ebony, the types of magazines that would have quoted him in the 70s. And I pieced together the way he portrayed himself. And that was very important to me because back then they didn't have social media. So getting your ideas out and getting your thought processes out was tricky. And also to be a black person with a plan, you know, that wasn't <laughs> always welcome. And so I wanted to give him agency and create a through line for him. Then we had to figure out, well, how will we voice this true essence of Ellis? Everything in the film was, word, was made of words that he actually said or wrote. So we didn't, we didn't reconstruct anything. But my job was to write a story and to look at the trajectory of his thoughts throughout the five-year arc or the span, the lifespan of the show and figure out what he was saying about the show and what his messaging was. And then, of course, the important part would be, well, how can we hear that in a way that's both <laughs> contemporary and historical? How will we find a voice that's not a caricature, but an actual sort of interpretation of Ellis? And he already had a very unique way of speaking that was sort of part like West Indian, Kingfish, English. I have no idea where he came up with that from because he's born in you know, the hood of DC. <laughs> Uh, but it was a very specific way of talking, and we thought, well, again, that could be performative Alice. Let's find a voice that matches that tone, that era, that dic that dictation, that um, that style uh, of speaking. And the first person I thought of was Blair Underwood. Blair has a spectacular voice. Not only is he a wonderful actor, and I've been a fan since L.A. Law back in the day. <laughs> I have to admit, showing my age, but yeah. <laughs> uh, but he's also an incredible voiceover actor. And he has voiced several uh, narrations for different types of documentaries. Mm -hmm. He also is the voice of a character in the next iteration of The Lion King. It's uh, an animated uh, series that's, that you can find online. And he plays Maku, which is, a, a, I think, I believe a crocodile character. Oh, wow. And so when I heard that and I heard his voice in a different context, and I'd already, you know, loved him for years and everything that he'd done, I was a big fan of, I realized that's the voice we need. Because A, he's a great actor and he can take any type of direction, but B, he has that voice that is just recognizable enough, but not too recognizable that it would interfere with the story and not such that it would take you out of the story. Now, there are other times when you've heard very famous people. For example, um, Samuel L. Jackson did the voiceover of I Am Not Your Negro. And he was distinctly different from um, James Baldwin, but we knew it was, we always knew it was Samuel L. Jackson doing the voice of James Baldwin. So there is that style too, which I thought was extremely effective and also brought in a younger audience and a, and a contemporary audience. But for our show, I wanted to find somebody who straddled those worlds of being super contemporary and also had his feet a little bit back in the old school world and that is Blair Underwood because of you know he's been around the block for a while now but he also he's super popular and new but he has those nuances where he could sound like he was from another time so that's how we chose him yeah, and he's just a remarkable he has a resonance and a um, a bloom in his voice that we knew could really create that interiority, that inner thought of Ellis Hazlett. Yeah. I think he did a phenomenal job. Uh, he did an excellent job. Had I not known he was in it, you couldn't even tell. So that was a great choice. And when, you know, that was very interesting because when I directed him um, in the voiceover recording session, we had all, I had all the vignettes planned out, but he hadn't really seen them yet. 
-hmm. So he, his job as an actor was to literally step into that, those shoes of Alice Hazel and imagine himself in those moments and imagine almost like he was talking to himself. So we're hearing the inner thoughts and we called those sequences the inner Ellis. <laughs> uh, and I, in the end, I was so grateful because we also put a GFX treatment on it so that we had a unifying graphic aesthetic. So every time you dropped into these little sequences of hearing Ellis's thoughts, mm -hmm. you also visually had like a one-on-one -on -one moment with Ellis as a character. And that was important so that people wouldn't be talking about him as much as he would be in first position in his own story. Often you don't get that. You get a lot of people talking about someone and you don't know what their, you know, what would have been their initiative for things or what would have been the impetus behind their actions. I really enjoyed that, I really enjoyed that. So given that, well, at least I haven't heard as much about Ellis, um, I've seen snippets of him in different programs. Do you think this will make the audience more familiar with him? Do you, have you had some reactions from people who've seen it and been like, I never knew about this guy or this is good to know? Oh, absolutely. And the, the most common thing, response I have experienced is, well, this is, you know, people have said, this is the greatest show you've never heard of. Yeah. And they are fall in love with Ellis and they fall in love with the show. And that creates two reactions usually a little bit of anger and frustration, like, damn, how come I never heard of this? How did I miss this all this time? My parents never told me, y'all were, you know, <laughs> falling out on me. Or, oh, thank God, someone finally did a film about this show. This has been sort of like a magical unicorn, you know, in our, of our past. And we, and some people remembered it, some people didn't. And we didn't want it to be a magical unicorn, a mythical story. It's a story about a real man who's really grounded in the truth of the facts of, of black life, black culture, black intellect, you know, black expression and the full experience of the black experience. And so we needed to tell that story and make it grounded and say, yes, it's special. Yes, it's a gem in terms of, but it, in terms of being historic, footage, but it's not precious. It's really who we are and it's a beautiful reflection of who we are. And that, and we take that into the present moment to show that many people stand on the shoulders of Soul and Ellis Hainsworth and, and people who are pushing the culture forward just like he did. And that was the, that's the impetus behind the line, you know, although it's over, it's not the end. Black seeds keep on growing. And even though that is, you know, obviously a line from the song, it was also at the time a uh, telegram, for those who remember what those are, <laughs> was sent by Patti LaBelle, who was a dear friend of Ellis Hazlitt's, to him for the last show on March 7th, 1973. And that's what she said, although it's over, it's not the end, black seeds keep on growing. And he reads that in the final episode. And I thought, wow, that is so profound that he knows that even though the show is ending that this is not the end of a movement it's really just the beginning and i can see parallels and you draw parallels with what was happening then in 68 to 73 and what's happening now as i said in the beginning of our conversation this could be the beginning of a new phase in america of you know social justice and equity and uh, a lot of the ills that we haven't faced in our past and a chance to face those now and in a reckoning to move forward. Yeah. Um, so I do have a question. Have you had audience react to some of the clips in the, uh, the film? I know for me, I've seen several clips where I've seen posted on Facebook, like the, um, um, the Nikki Giovanni and the James Baldwin conversation and the Stevie Wonder, Stevie Wonder performance, the Yagri performance. I was just like, I've been seeing these on social media and I do like them and enjoy them. I wonder who, who else has reacted in that way. Do people understand yeah. like, all those come from soul? <laughs> oh, and that's, I'm so glad you mentioned that. 
Um, in January 2019, my phone started blowing up one day, and everyone was like, do you see it? Do you see it? It's all over Instagram. And I thought, <laughs> I'm on Instagram, but I didn't see it. I wasn't tagged. And I thought, well, what's going on? And it turned out that Amanda Seals, mm. an amazing actress and, and host and brilliant mind, uh, love her so much, had posted a, a clip of the James Baldwin, Nikki Giovanni soul episode, which was taped in London in 1971. Mm -hmm. And it went viral. But literally 439,000 comments and likes. But people were responding to it as if it were now. They weren't treating it like a precious gem from the past or some special thing from another time. I was the one saying, hey, everybody, <laughs> that's a clip from Soul, and we featured it in our film. No, it, what was important was the way people were responding to it, responding to these two great icons of Black literature one younger, one older, you know, going at it, almost sparring and, and talking about black love and black relationships and black family. And those are issues that are really important right now. So it didn't even feel dated. That blew me away. I was mad because the, cut, the comments had been cut off. So I couldn't even get in there and make a comment on Instagram. <laughs> but I was so happy to see it, it have a new life and then it was reposted by Lena Waif and reposted by Poor Harriet and reposted by Essence Magazine, for example. And suddenly it started building its own life. And you realize this shouldn't be in a vault for 50 years. This was made for the people by the people in 1971. Why can't we have this now? This is our food. We need this. Just like we need Mr. Soul. Just, you know, so that made me very excited. And even last month in Jill, Actually, no, just a few weeks ago, August 4th, again, she posted a clip from the same episode. And instead, it was James Baldwin talking about what he would do if he were stopped by a cop mm -hmm. and how difficult that would be because one of us would end up dead, he said. And I was like, wow, you know, excuse me, night. <laughs> excuse me, 2020, 1971 is calling. Yep. <laughs> you know, like, how is this so relevant today? So incredible that we're having the same conversations. And that made me all the more fortified to know we need this show right now, maybe even to bring the show back on the air, but we certainly need this as a dialogue and as a, as a, a reminder of this sort of cultural experience that we share all the time, but that has been you know, muted, especially in the, in the last four years. So one of the things I noticed, it, it came across my mind, was when Questlove said, what would happen had Soul stayed on the air? What do you think would have happened? Let me tell you about Questlove, because we, uh, before I answer that, he is a huge fan of Soul. <laughs> he has traveled around the world to locate as many episodes of it. And he told me, like, categorically, he could list every episode, which performers were on there, he had an encyclopedic memory and knowledge of soul, and even said that they often, the roots would, had mirrored some of the shows that he'd done and created their sets based on the different artists who appeared on soul. I was amazed by that. Um, we shot him in an interview a couple of years ago uh, at the Tonight Show, and that was, you know, before Corona, obviously, BC, I call it. And, um, we were backstage at the Tonight Show and in a, in a little tiny dressing room and he just went off on all these extraordinary episodes of Soul and how it impacted him as a musician. And so he said, you know, he had come of age when his parents were activists at the time and this show was really very important. It was a part of his cultural daily intake, he said. And so by him saying, can you imagine how we would how different we would be if we had you know 20 years of soul as opposed to five years of soul and i think that that speaks volumes because this notion of freedom of expression freedom of speech and this idea of having a platform for your voice that is so key to culture and art well, let me say art impacting culture and culture impacting change not only change for the greater good, but change around the, the perception of African American culture. And so I think that if Seoul had continued, it would have 
not only changed the landscape of television even more, but I think it would have created even more opportunities for artists. The way, we, the way there are more opportunities now. But you have to remember that there were only like three stations on public television back then. So it was very restricted and Soul interrupted that landscape, which was predominantly white and uh, you know, brought inclusion to, inclusion and diversity to broadcasting. Okay, okay. Um, so you think, that, is there any show that you think has, that has been comparable to it? Because that show was very unique. It was definitely a variety show. Yeah. Hard to say. Um, that's a good question. I, you might have stumped me because I don't know if I thought of a show that's comparable to Soul. But I think there needs to be a show yeah. that's like Soul, if not the next iteration of Soul. Because I think we need to see, now there's, you know, Desus and Miro, Miro, you know, there, there's different platforms that are starting to change. And, I, you know, of course, Black Girl uh, sketch comedy show. And like, there are different shows where you see more freedom. And of course, everything Ava DuVernay is doing in film and everything uh, Lena Waithe is doing. And you see giant strides being taken. I won't compare them to that particular type of um, format, mm -hmm. but that format was very specific to the time. And they were responding to being on the heels of the civil rights movement in the, the midst of the, you know, the tumultuous time that came right after the assassination of Martin Luther King. And so they were responding to that. I think something in this time period would look a lot different. And of course, with the freedom of this sort of post-genre moment we're in, whether it's post-genre music, people dropping, you know, being free to drop their music on Spotify and, or, or just wipe clean their Spotify and start again, that's really indicative of a, a sense of freedom that we haven't had before. Um, but if you think of one, I'd be curious. No, have, that's really what you have you have <laughs> No, I, I was trying to think of one. I was like, what could be comparable? Because you know, I'm trying to write the article, and I'm like, I can't think of anything that is so well-rounded, so full of art and culture. I yeah. can't think of anything. So I was like, let me ask Melissa if she knows of any show that's comparable, because I have no clue. Um, <laughs> so why... I'm about that. I'm going to have to email you if I come up with one, because I certainly would want to shout it out if there is one. But um, I think the energy, the energy and the legacy of that energy and that intention is mm. what's important now and what we are seeing more of now. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, so while you were doing your research, you're looking through the archives. What was your reaction once you went through all the archives? Like while you're looking through and researching, what has been your various reactions to the uh, various uh, amounts of footage? I, first of all, I was, it was very daunting because I thought, how in the world are we ever going to make a choice to, out of all this extraordinary footage and these wonderful performers and no performer is more important than the next or no activist is more important or more significant. So how are we going to structure this? I was feeling that I wish I had made a series, to be honest. <laughs> Maybe this should have been a docu-series, <laughs> and then I'd have more time. It's always the, the challenge of having enough time, but also being economic with your storytelling, right? And so the, having to actually cut it down to uh, 90 minutes or under 100 minutes was very, very important because we realized, well, we have three stories to tell. You know, the storyline A would be the story of Soul, from 1968 to 1973, we have a finite number of episodes to show, 130. Then storyline B would be the story of Ellis Hazlip, not necessarily a cradle of grave story, but let's drop in on his life during the time he's making Soul and how his life impacts Soul. And then you have the third story, storyline C, which is really the zeitgeist, right? What's happening in the nation that, is that people are responding to that gives, that gives rise to a show like Soul. So we have these three stories and then we decided how do we collapse three stories into one? And how do we find the most salient moments of each three stories and make sure they marry up so that everything earns its way in? So that was my rule for the footage. Yes, I'm in love with everything that, you know, with five, Jake, uh, five Al Green songs. 
And please don't make me choose between an Albie song and a Stevie Wonder song. But as we're telling the, if it's about music, as we're telling the journey of music and treating music as a character, which song is the right song for the moment? If we're talking about the roots of black protests and making a montage about that, what will be the underpinning of that song? You know, we have a sequence that we call Nixon, Angela Nixon where we cut back and forth on this idea of the real voice of America. And we're hearing what Nixon is saying to the people and we're hearing the, what Angela Davis is saying to the people and these two disparate um, voices clashing against each other. And we use the underpinning of, you know, sometimes I feel like a motherless child in a very piercing gospel to push that narrative forward. So we're always making choices about these three storylines. And so that really dictated what would get into the film and what honestly wouldn't make it into the film. So the cutting room floor was very deep <laughs> and it was hard. And so, but in going through all the footage, what was surprising to me were the really intimate moments and the things you wouldn't expect to see. For example, Ellis Hazlett giving voice to an, a musician whom you don't usually get to hear speak but he let Curtis Mayfield host three episodes. And he's not just getting up and singing, he's actually speaking and interviewing other artists and that sort of intellectual spine carries through the entire series and it's very surprising. And I also like the iconoclastic angle he would take where he would pit an activist against like, you know, most popular um, black, um, dentist from the community mm. and everyone had a place and every job had a role and every story was important and was given equal importance as was every person in the audience so that's what was really illuminating is that not only was it like a time capsule but it was um really a love letter to black culture the whole archive was a love letter to black culture oh yeah I, I loved it. We need that right now. <laughs> Ever. You know, because it's not just about Ellis championing Black culture, but this idea of championing story, Black stories now more than ever. So that's really, that's really important to me. Yeah. Um, speaking of the music, you chose to work with Mr. Robert Glasper and Layla Hathaway. Yeah. About that's that's like a winning combination right there. Listen. Well, first of all, first of all, we have Donny Hathaway kicks off the film. You probably noticed that the very first thing you hear after the introduction is Donny Hathaway singing the ghetto. That's a live version of Donny Hathaway in the studio uh, of Soul performing that. Mm. So when I'm thinking about the the journey of black music and we're starting with Donny Hathaway, I figured, well, we have to end with the first daughter of Soul, his daughter, uh, Layla Hathaway. So we chose Layla to sing the end credit song that was written specifically for the film by uh, Robert Glasper and with lyrics by Muhammad Ayers. And we kn I knew that th those would be our two bookends. Robert Glasper is a genius, first of all. Yes. He is straight genius and what he brought to the project was extraordinary because he works with a lot of different artists he also has an uncanny ability to hear and understand mimic and create any genre of music in the drop of a hat without rehearsal so when we were recording the you know we recorded the soundtrack with 13 um, screens around the the studio where we were, the Red Bull Studios in Chelsea, with some phenomenal musicians who had never even rehearsed. And if I said to him, you know, I need a, uh, this is a moment, and he looked on the screen, this is the moment where we're going to London and we have Nikki Giovanni and James Baldwin and I need something that feels like uh, Maiden Voyage. Can you give me Maiden Voyage here? A Maiden Voyage vibe, because obviously, we're taking this voyage across, but it also ties into what we were hearing at that moment. And um, he said, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Got it. Went into the studio, knocked it out, one take. 
and did this over and over and over. And we had about 56 music cues. It was a very healthy soundtrack, including the songs that were in there and the songs that were written. Um, just genius, beyond genius. And again, the thing about Robert Glasper is he is a really old soul in a young man's body. So he can, he's so fluid as a musician that he can harken back, his sound can harken back to any era. Yeah. But also then he can create on the spot, improvise on the spot and pay homage to so, many, so much of this era. And we chose him because he had just come off a wonderful film about Miles Davis the Miles Ahead film, which was not a documentary, but the Don Cheadle theatrical story. Mm -hmm. uh, and he had won a Grammy for a best compilation soundtrack for that. And our music supervisor, Ed Gerard, had worked with him. And I thought, you know what? That's, that's perfect. Because he knows Miles. We have some Miles Davis in the film, a little live version of Bitches Brew. And, uh, and I knew that he would understand this journey of music that we were on, but he would bring this contemporary vibe to it and would give us vibes for everybody. So Nixon had a theme, Malcolm X had a theme, Ellis had a theme, and we strung together th this sort of soundscape that was just as important an homage to the music of the times as it is the approach of a contemporary genius to this, to this um, oeuvre. So that was very, very exciting to work with him. And we're coming out with a soundtrack, so that's going to be great, too. Wow, yeah, let me know when that comes out. <laughs> oh, sure. <laughs> I got to interview um, him for the photograph, so I really enjoyed it. When I saw he was on there, I was like, this is going to be an amazing film. It should be, and it was, by the way. Yeah. Um, so my last question is, if you had to describe your filmmaking experience on this film in four words, what would they what would they be well are they four words that are making a sentence or are they just four descriptive words since you're an artist you can pick okay so in four words how do i describe mr soul in four words unapologetically black Love. Wait, no, let me start over. Unapologetically <laughs> black, revolutionary, and legacy. So those don't those don't necessarily come together in a sentence, but unapologetically black definitely comes together. And this idea of legacy and this idea of revolutionary. And I think we're in a revolution right now as well. And so there's the same underpinnings of change that were impacting uh, the movements of the 60s when the show began in 1968 are, uh, are you know, pushing us forward right now. And so Ellis was a quiet revolutionary, but I think what he did on the show was really remarkable. And right now we are in the midst of a revolution that is pushed by, by the people. So, I think that the, it is a film for this time, just as much as it is an homage and a love letter to that time. Right. Uh, how was that? <laughs> that was great. That was great. the spot. Wow. I, should, I didn't have that one in my back pocket. It, it was a great film, and I had all these thoughts in my head, and so I was just writing down questions. and Because I, I, I would love to have experienced this like with you, just like seeing all the footage and seeing the artists that you work with and just... It was just a great film. I was just, I was texting my mother. I was like, "Did you see this growing up? Did you did, did Grandma see this?" Where, 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 where was your mom? Where was she at that time? Oh, she was in Louisville, Kentucky. Okay, so Kentucky. I'm not sure about Kentucky. I can find out. You know, the thing, the problem. Well, I shouldn't say that. The challenge at the time was, and and it is mentioned. In